everyone. Thank you very much for coming here. Uh, today we have uh, Mate. Uh, he's a co-founder of uh, Mindworks. If you haven't heard about Mindworks, it's a company that helps a client understand the impact of uh, behavioral economics and psychology on HR sales and marketing. So I'll let him talk about everything else. Uh, just don't forget to leave your feedback at the end of the session uh, and enjoy the talk. Thank you. Just Mark leave you. the positive feedback. <laughs> okay, so um, what I'll talk about is, um, you know, I was when I was asking when to talk about behavioral economics or to um, talk about, I don't know, my story, whether it's interesting or not, or what to um, give you some kind of, I don't know, inspirational talk. I was, Maya told me, just put it all in, in one presentation. <laughs> um, so I thought, okay, so um, why not to talk about success, luck, trying, and behavioral economics? So um, uh, that's mind-blowing, right? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll tell you basically two stories, two stories about the same thing, uh, two stories about uh, our story, basically. Um, where I come from, um, how we started, where we are at the moment, and then I'll take you behind the scenes because uh, the same story can be uh, told in many different ways, you know. And and you keep hearing the 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 hero stories where where, where uh, you know the, the founder is the is the big hero and he's doing everything right. And, uh, um, it's all thanks to him, but. Um, and I think that's going to be one of my messages today, is that uh, it's not always only thanks to uh, the big guy. And uh, if there is any success at all, it's kind of a mix of uh, all kind of things. Um, I'm, I studied behavioral, uh, not behavioral economics, actuarial mathematics. Have you ever heard of actuarial mathematics? Actuarial mathematics, so it's insurance mathematics. So basically, uh, it's not only mathematics, but it's you know you go deeper into insurance, so it must be super boring. This. <laughs> um, and uh, so I did my studies here in, in Denmark, and I started working um, in in Vienna in um, Vienna Insurance Group. But and during my studies in uh, uh, in Copenhagen, I stumbled across this book. Because I've always been interested in business, in management, in uh, entrepreneurship, and um, somehow um, this got in my hands, and I, I went through it. I read the book, and I was I was mind blown. Um, if you're interested in the subject, after my my speech here, uh, go for it. Go for this book because uh, it might very well change your perception of uh, people around you, of communication. Of sales, of marketing, of uh, everything and anything, um, and it completely changed my my life basically. Because from that moment on, that was say seven, eight years ago, I dedicated all my free time to uh, studying behavioral economics. Um, I got my job in Vienna, and um, every day I was commuting by train from Bratislava to Vienna, and uh, I would wake up at five thirty in the morning and, and read about behavioral economics and on. on the, the train journey to, to Vienna and on the way back was constantly reading and doing all kind of courses and um, um, as, as you know time was progressing my, my interest in behavioral economics was uh, growing and my interest in actual mathematics was uh, dying and uh, one day it totally died out and um, I remember that day I was sitting in my in my office and looking at my Excels and some prediction models, uh, and I was thinking, I don't give a shit about this. And I was, you know, thinking about uh, um, all the, the the astonishing applications of, uh, of behavioral economics. And uh, I thought, okay, I, I I have to quit. So I went to my boss. I quit my job, and um, I had this idea. So let's found a company. Uh, which will do consulting for other businesses, which will help other businesses uh, uh, to apply these insights from, from behavioral sciences. And uh, uh, if you have no clue what is behavioral economics, I'll get to that, no worries. Um, and um, so uh, on, on 1st of September, 
in the, it was in 2015, um, I stayed at home and um, I had this idea of uh, building a consulting company. Of course, no one wants uh, advice from you if uh, you have absolutely no clients, absolutely no track record. And um, uh, very quickly we uh, realized that, that no one actually gave a shit. Mm -hmm. um, so we uh, started talking about, uh, uh, so it was uh, when uh, the, the company was founded, we started talking a lot about the topic um, at universities, at uh, some meetups, some, some small gatherings. Um, we started writing about the topic, blog posts. Uh, Jenik N was actually very uh, uh, interested in the topic, so uh, we wrote a lot of articles in Jenik and in, in Smack. And um, slowly, uh, you know, some, some first clients were starting to be um, kind of interested. Definitely, it wasn't the big corporations. Uh, because they need um, someone they can trust. They need someone with a track record, which is well obvious. Um, but then, uh, the next year, uh, we got our first big client, and that was uh, uh, Duovera, the, uh, the health insurer. And uh, the, until, until now, I think this is one of the most beautiful projects we've ever worked on. Um, and now I'm getting to what actually behavior economics is all, all about. It is a beautiful mix of psychology, economic sociology, which is studying how people behave, how they make decisions, how basically everything is happening in our subconscious minds. Um, I can ask you about the same thing in two different ways. And uh, this half will get the first you know, framing the second half, the second framing, and your answers will be totally different. Um, an example that, or, or a small experiment we always do, uh, we often do at um, our workshops or, uh, or uh, um, conferences, is that we uh, divide uh, the audience into two halves. They don't know about it, and we ask them the, basically the same thing. Imagine you're buying a new laptop, and uh, it, it costs, I don't know, 450 euros. And uh, you can choose which of the following five accessories, laptop, you want to buy together with it. And uh, you guys on the right side, well, your left side, uh, your question would be just put a circle on, on those uh, accessories you want to buy. And uh, your question would be basically the same but a little bit different. So imagine you're buying this laptop and there's these accessories you can buy together with it. Cross out those you don't want to buy. And uh, if we make an average of uh, how big the package of accessories would be here and would be here, where do you think we get a bigger one? <laughs> this side, where you're crossing out. And um, roughly, um, with the prices that we set on the accessories, you would end up with the package worth around 100 euros you will end up with back to worth 60 euros. A huge difference, the same question. In a rational world, this would never ever happen. But we're not in a rational world. And uh, especially, you know, um, science and, and, and studies, research shows that um, up to 90, 95% of purchase decisions happen subconsciously. What does it mean? Well, it means that we uh, you know, don't consider pros and cons when you're evaluating whether to buy something or not. Uh, there are so many external factors, so many uh, um, you know, subconscious um, kind of um, shortcuts that we use when deciding. And this is what behavioral economics is all about. And uh, this is what I got so fascinated by. So, but back to Duovera. So, what did we do there? Uh, it's not only about purchase decisions, and if you don't mind, I take this off. <laughs> uh, it's not only about purchase decisions. And, uh, um, the project there was about patients with diabetes. Uh, because uh, Duovera, they have a, uh, a great program for their diabetes patients. Uh, it's a program which consists of roughly um, eight two-hour education sessions uh, where they teach them um, all kind of aspects of uh, about the disease, uh, how they should uh, 
know, move, how they should eat, what they should do, what they shouldn't do. Um, but, you know, we came there and we told them, guys, you know, this is great if you want to pass information. But this is not good if you really want to change their behavior. Because I, you all know that getting information is far, far, far from actually acting upon the information. So we transformed the, the whole program. We uh, uh, brought in all the, the behavioral knowledge so that uh, we don't only give information, but so that we change behaviors. Um, it, it lasted for a couple of months. They, uh, they loved the ideas. We uh, worked with uh, um, you know, social pressure with, within the group. We worked with all kinds of small commitments that the patients would have to make. And uh, we transformed the program so that it actually achieves uh, a behavior change. So this was one example of uh, um, what behavioral economists can do uh, besides sales, besides marketing, besides communication, changing behavior, creating habits. Uh, if uh, you want to achieve uh, lasting behavior change, you have to create a habit. And if you want to create a habit, there's, uh, there's a science behind it. That's also what behavioral economics is about. Um, so this was our first corporate client. And um, then in uh, 2017, we uh, started getting um, some small clients, not, not corporations yet. Uh, that was until that moment, still the, uh, the only one. Um, but April 2017 was approaching and uh, together with the, with the date, uh, also the daffodil date, Jen Artiso. And um, uh, we heard that uh, not only, you know, you have hundreds of volunteers going out on the streets and, and uh, collecting money for, uh, for the good cause. And we learned that not only uh, you know individuals, but also companies are helping um, the Liga uh, to, uh, to uh, raise funds. And uh, the way they do it is that, for example, O2 uh, gave them forty thousand uh, text messages they would send out as fundraising messages. So um, we thought, okay, so how could we contribute? So we uh, went to uh, Liga Protiragovia and we told them, look, guys, we're doing this kind of uh, behavioral magic, so if you want to, uh, we can help you uh, redesign the text of the message so that it raises more money. And they were like, okay, why not? I mean, if you do it for free, let's, let's, let's jump on it, let's, let's try it. Uh, we went to O2, we pitched them the same idea, they were like, okay, perfect, so let's test a couple of ideas, and the one which works best, we'll roll it out to uh, the tens of thousands of people who will get our messages. And um, so uh, we uh, um, back into research, you know, we uh, went to uh, all kind of behavioral um, studies which uh, uh, focused on fundraising and how um, reframing a message, how using specific behavioral principles, principles from social psychology could, uh, you know, enhance the message. And uh, eventually we came up with three ideas and uh, we tested the three ideas against the, the the control message, the original one they wanted to use, uh, and which they used the year before. You know, the uh, the original message was uh, the usual stuff: uh, help oncological patients by sending an empty message to this number, blah blah. blah. And um, one of our messages um, used a um, very specific principle, which was called reciprocity. Uh, the principle of reciprocity basically says, if I do something for you, you'll be inclined to do a favor for me. The trick is that you have to do, or, I mean, you need to have the feeling that I did something for you first. Now, the question was, okay, so well, this is a nice principle, but how to get it inside a few you know, words in a text message? And um, what we did was something like this. If you are in need, we would be there to help you. You can help already today by sending an empty SMS to uh, this number. Uh, and when I tested it, this message was 55% more effective than the original message. Uh, so 
logically they rolled out the uh, the most effective one, this one using reciprocity, <coughs> and raised thousands of euros more um, than uh, would uh, have raised the original message. And uh, why I put it here is because it's on one hand uh, a very nice example of how changing just a few words. And what's important here is that it's not about no, nice copywriting. It is about uh, the underlying psychological principle. Because we are not very creative. Uh, we are not a marketing agency. We do science. We uh, apply science. Um, and when the science is wrapped up in uh, something creative, it can bring beautiful results. Um, and the second reason why I put it here is that this was our first project where we had numbers, we had measurable results, which we could show other companies, look guys, here we change a few words and increase the, the effectiveness by 55%. And uh, this helped us hugely in, uh, in all the subsequent sales that we did and all the subsequent pitches. Um, next year, or the second half of 2017 and the year 2018 were great. Um, because somehow, suddenly, more and more companies started coming to us. And um, it somehow uh, turned out that we wouldn't be a consultancy for small businesses, but we would actually be a consultancy for obviously quite large companies, corporations. Um, and uh, we worked on, 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 on all kinds of projects from you know, optimizing uh, a sales funnel of uh, um, travel insurance for uh, Union, um, Solvenska Electra, and that was uh, about sales as well. Um, Orange, optimizing SMS campaigns, but also hiring at Orange. And um, a very nice project we had uh, was, uh, I guess you know, uh, Partners Group. It's uh, financial brokers. And uh, they, um, um, approached us with the, you might you know, expect a, a project focused on sales, like help us communicate better, sell better, but what they were concerned with was hiring. Because uh, you know, the reputation that financial brokers have is not very good. And uh, you know, we, when they have you at an interview, I mean, you're not very likely to uh, get a job there. So they needed help, and um, uh, this was a project which lasted for uh, nearly a year. We, um, so what we did was that we sat at the interviews. We observed the top performers, we observed the, the low performers, and um, then we put together a new hiring strategy, a new way um, how to communicate at the interviews. And, um, I don't want to go into detail because there was um, really a lot of um, behavioral insights used there. But uh, since I've already talked about reciprocity in the message, I want to show you how the same principle can be used in a totally different setup of a job interview. And um, so if, if you come to a job interview, the, the usual way it goes is that um, they first start asking you questions about yourself, about your experience. and uh, then they tell you a few words about the position, the, the company, and, uh, yeah, and that's it. And we thought, okay, there is this principle of reciprocity, which can work like magic, and we saw it. And uh, research suggests it should work. But how can we bring it into a setup with, where it hasn't been tested anywhere, anywhere, anytime in the world? And um, we thought, okay, so let's switch and, and swap the order of uh, how the interview goes. So uh, instead of first starting asking you questions, what the recruiter would do would be uh, that he would tell you his own story. He would tell you the story of uh, how he got to the company. And we exactly told them how to compose the story. Now, what makes for a good story, for, a, for an emotional story. 
and uh, they started using it. We trained them, and uh, you know the feedbacks we were getting were, and this is magical. The, suddenly the the whole interview feels totally different. Uh, people are so much more open. They're not afraid to uh, share their own stories because I did the first step. Uh, and uh, suddenly they have tendency to reciprocate back. So um, another example of how, you know, <coughs> just understanding what's going on in the minds of those people I'm communicating with, of those people I want to, uh, say, influence, I want to change. If you understand what's going on in their minds, you're suddenly able to uh, um, prepare a much better approach. You suddenly know uh, how to use all these principles to uh, um, achieve what you want to achieve, whether it's uh, effective communication, whether it's uh, behavior change uh, of diabetes patients or more effective hiring. And uh, in um, 2018, we um, started working on um, uh, the, the biggest project so far. And uh, when we started, it was around March, April, we thought, okay, this would be done within four or five months. Uh, we're still not done. Um, and um, I remember uh, this was uh, one, I think it was Sunday afternoon, we were coming back with my co-founder um, from, from a weekend trip. And, uh, you know, we were brainstorming about um, what we could do better. Uh, that consulting is fun, I mean, consulting is great, but if you want to scale the business, consulting is, um, well, it all, you have to be there. You cannot do consulting if you're not there. So we thought, okay, the other thing we're doing is uh, trainings. And um, uh, how to scale trainings? Well, let's try to uh, uh, come up with uh, an online training. So, okay, so people and, and everybody who comes to our, and we call it consumer psychology school, Everybody's amazed because um, you know we have uh, marketers, marketing directors with 20 years of experience coming to our workshops. This was actually funny when we started. You know, I was 28, I guess, when we organized our first workshop. My co-founder as well. My colleague was 25, I guess, and um, we had these big fish, the marketing director, sitting there and, and listening to what we had to say and uh, you know we had to uh, you know act quite <laughs> quite self-confident uh, but I think it, it, it paid out because uh, um, they started applying it and, and we're getting feedbacks that they are getting results but we thought okay so all these people are so excited by what we have to say let's try to um, um, make something global because um, behavioral economics is um, becoming a huge trend uh, and it's slowly transforming business um, marketing sales as we know them today and surprisingly there's not that many companies that not that many people who are doing this this kind of consulting this kind of trainings in the world so I thought okay let's do an online training and we thought okay but if we want to be successful in um, uh, globally, it cannot be just us, two or three of us. We have to get on board some big names. And, uh, you know, we've been bold a lot of times until that moment, so we thought, okay, let's be bold once again. And um, uh, maybe you uh, remember uh, last June there was a conference, HR Leaders, uh, and um, the keynote speaker was uh, Dan Ariely, the guy who uh, wrote the book I showed you at the beginning. And uh, this guy, this uh, Dan Ariely, I was uh, you know, reading books from and uh, was so, so amazed by, he came to that conference and he thought, okay, so this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. We have to uh, catch his attention somehow. So we're thinking what to do and how to catch his attention. And we thought, okay, let's just, let's keep it simple. Let's just write him a letter, a letter to Dan we called it, which uh, explained and uh, uh, how he changed a couple of lives here in Slovakia. So it was a, a one-pager when we outlined um, 
how I stumbled across his book, how uh, um, we founded the company, how we struggled, how uh, we succeeded, how uh, more people were joining, and uh, uh, we uh, then enclosed a picture of uh, the whole team, and everybody wrote him a small note. Uh, we wrapped it in a nice package. I gave it to him, and then two weeks later, I wrote him an email. Now I went to Google. I, I typed Dan Ariely, and I went to his website, and there was his e email Dan at DanArielli.com, which I thought no one would ever read and ever answer. But I wrote him anyway. Hey Dan, um, so I hope it made you uh, smile a bit. The the gift we gave you. Now we have these two projects uh, we are thinking about. Which one would you like to join? And then in three days, it was seven in the morning, I opened my laptop and there was an email from Dan Ariely. Whichever you want, just tell me. And I thought, what the hell? <laughs> Seriously, is this happening? And um, on 28th of uh, October, we uh, went to the US, we went to Duke University and we uh, um, recorded the uh, the parts of the course with Dan Ariely and um, uh, we got 200 speakers from London in December we went to London we recorded with them and um, now we're next week we're launching the course um, the first time ever that uh, seven and a half hours of brilliant video content and hundreds of pages of materials have been put together um, basically who's behind it three guys from Slovakia who uh, a couple of years ago uh, had no clue about uh, about uh, um, basically behavioral economics. Um, so this is basically the first story I want to tell you, the the hero story. But I want to I want to bring you behind the scenes because um, uh, and. Not, maybe not at each you know, circle here, because we probably don't have time for that, but I just want to tell you the kind of, should I call it luck, or should I call it coincidence, which uh, was there and which helped us, helped us succeed. Um, you now I've been talking about how I founded the company, how I well, I don't know, sold it and so on and so on. <coughs> I have a co-founder and uh, the whole idea was uh, was his idea. We actually uh, just across the street here uh, uh, in the Relax building there was Body Energy Club and I remember that day we uh, it was a, a Saturday or Sunday because we always went there Saturday or Sunday so we um, had a workout, went to the, to the sauna and uh, as we were leaving he was like you know, you're so fascinated by it. Let's found a company. And that was the moment where I started really thinking about it. Um, our first corporation. Um, we would have never ever got the project if um, uh, there wasn't one guy who was uh, actually a scientist, who is now the director of uh, the, uh, the, the, the strategy department and uh, he's a social scientist. He was just finishing his PhD and uh, he was a huge fan of uh, uh, behavioral economics. And he uh, heard me at a, um, it was a panel discussion. It was a complete failure because um, I think there were four panelists and three people in the audience. And he was one of the three people. And uh, he heard what we were doing and then we started talking. Uh, it was a pure coincidence. Um, I didn't tell you that my sister is working at O2 and uh, uh, if she hadn't been there probably would, we would have never got in touch with the people at, at O2 who um, uh, run the campaigns and uh, she lobbied you know so that we could test our ideas which turned out to be good. Um, there was a lot of uh, uh, small coincidences in all these projects uh, but one of the biggest ones is um, here. You now, uh, um, I told you that two weeks later, after uh, the conference, I wrote him an email. But I didn't want to write him an email. I thought it was all screwed. But then there was a, a guy who is actually 
consulting with us or working with us on an external basis. And um, we were talking about it. And he was like, hey, dude, you have to try to write it. And I did, and he answered. Uh, had the guy not been there, I wouldn't have written probably. And uh, would have never uh, produced the course. And uh, actually, this presentation, I, I gave it last year at the... Uh, a conference called Visionaries 2018 and um, you know, as I was preparing for uh, that presentation I live at Delhaid Yeli and um, sometimes I go to the forest and I just walk up and down and I think about all kind of stuff and uh, um, I was walking up and down the forest thinking about all kind of stuff and uh, among the, <laughs> the all kind of stuff was also this presentation I was thinking so how did it actually happen that I got to the conference? And um, so I tried to track it back because I, I got a call from uh, Zlatica Zapushkarova asking me if uh, I would like to come and speak about uh, what we do at the conference. I said yes and I asked, so how did you get my number? And she said, well, I got it from, uh, from a guy from a partner's group. Actually, a director at partner's group. I started thinking, okay, how did I get to know this guy? And actually, I got to know this guy through uh, another director who started working with us. And then I was thinking, how did I get to know? How, how did I get to know this director? And uh, I I got to know him through my personal financial advisor. I was thinking, how did I get to know the, my 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 financial advisor? And it turned out that. I met him through his girlfriend. And uh, how did I meet his girlfriend? Well, it turned out uh, his girlfriend um, was doing, um, maybe you've heard of it, Circuscus. It was, uh, you know what? Maybe some of you. And my mom is organizing every summer a, a black and white camp for uh, poor children from, uh, from the Roma community and, uh, and uh, the, the majority. And, um, his girlfriend came there for one day to, uh, you know, give this this circus presentation, and I went to pick her up to uh, uh, Jarnovica, and uh, um, on the way back to Banska Stiavnica, I told her about what I was doing, and she she thought, okay, this might be interesting, and you might actually have a lot of stuff to talk about with uh, my boyfriend, and. Uh, uh, I'm not going any further because that's my mom, and you probably know how I know my mom. Uh, but what is the bottom line? The bottom line is that uh, you're not responsible for all your successes. I'm not. I'm very far from saying uh, that we're, you know, puppets of uh, of the destiny, and uh, you know, you can just do nothing, and uh, uh, you know, you have a predestined. Uh, future. No, I think I think that's bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a very rational person, uh, but I think this kind of helps you to um, see a better perspective of uh, your success or of uh, what you have achieved. It's not only thanks to you. There are coincidences, and you should go out and seek those coincidences. The second thing is that circumstances are not responsible for all your failures. That's the opposite, and uh, that's what we're very inclined to do, and it has a name in psychology. It's called fundamental attribution error. All the successes, we attribute them to ourselves. All the failures to others and circumstances. That's not true. And uh, probably the, the thing that... Um, uh, is most important and uh, what I have learned to, uh, from when we founded the company, it's not many years ago, it's just three and a half years ago, um, is that we would have never succeeded if we hadn't tried. Because, um, no, and it wasn't only with Dan Ariel that we tried to uh, you know, approach him. When, when um, we thought about um, uh, when we thought about the course, I mean, it cost quite a lot of time and quite a lot of money. So we thought, let's find some sponsors. 
and the, the whole course is behavioral economics and psychology and marketing. So we thought, okay, let's try to find some sponsors, some, some online marketing tools. But how to get them? How to approach them? Well, so what we did was a, a huge list of all kind of marketing tools uh, from all around the world. Then we uh, tried to find, uh, find emails to approach them. And they wouldn't answer. <laughs> then we tried to approach them on LinkedIn. They, most of them wouldn't answer. And uh, what we did then was that we uh, you know, found those support ad um, name of the company emails. And we started sending emails to those info support emails. And it turned out that the support people, they have to process your email. And that's a great thing because they can't, just cannot ignore it. And that's how we got our two sponsors and we ra raised money from them. Um, so try. I mean, if you don't try, you can never know if you can succeed or not. Um, we've tried a lot of times. We've failed a lot of times. But uh, those couple of times that we succeeded, actually, were worth all the efforts. And, uh, um, well, one last thing. We were of behavioral economics because uh, it's, it's huge. It's great. It can help you... Uh, change your own life, it can uh, help you uh, um, build new habits, break bad habits, uh, it helps you understand what stands behind your behaviors, behind the decisions of others, behind uh, uh, why your loved ones, your children are behaving in ways that they are behaving. It gives you the simple tools to um, communicate more effectively. You know, I've changed my life through behavioral economics. I've become much more effective. I've uh, become much more, um, I'd say, healthy. I have a much healthier lifestyle because you know, we all know it. I mean, I should do it. Oh, okay, I had a cake for lunch. That's, yeah. Um, we should, you know, we should exercise. From uh, uh, the 1st of May, I'll start exercising. But the 1st of May comes and I never start exercising. You know, and how to I have to build a bridge over this gap, this action intention gap. And behavioral economics can give you the tools. So uh, um, this is basically my short presentation, my short two stories about uh, how uh, uh, we uh, got fascinated by behavioral economics and uh, uh, that we uh, still keep trying and uh, we hope for the best. Thank you. We have some questions on Slido, so maybe I will start with those and then we give <coughs> some space also for the people who are in the audience. So, uh, one question we have here. Where is the border between science and manipulation? As a reference maybe to what you were saying about the example of the interview. Yeah, this is the, the uh, <coughs> most usual question that we, uh, we get. And uh, my most usual answer is that, uh, you know, all the, the psychological these behavioral insights are just tools. And you cannot say whether a tool is good or a tool is bad. Um, and, um, you know, the, what the question that we ask ourselves uh, when facing, you know, the decision whether to uh, uh, get on a project or not is, uh, so what is the goal of the project? And uh, there's not a clear metric for... Uh, evaluating whether something is uh, still good and uh, it, now it suddenly becomes bad. Uh, but um, I wouldn't think of it as uh, manipulation. I would think of it as tools and it all depends on uh, what you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, do you use your behavioral psychology skills on a day-to-day basis? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every day uh, actually, my colleagues are laughing at me because uh, I uh, do it subconsciously, sub subconsciously when I talk to them. <laughs> I you know, use all kind of uh, um, behavioral tools to um, you know, make it more effective, maybe. I try to uh, change my own behavior to uh, these tools. And uh, since I'm doing business development, every single day I have to use it. Yeah. <laughs> and the last question from Slido so far. Okay, one more just popped up. Uh, what are your next steps where you want to expand my works? 
Well, my idea is that um, okay. I want to bring the company global. Um, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to stay here in Slovakia because I think uh, um, we should try. Um, we should uh, um, aim as high as possible, and I sincerely hope that this course that we're launching uh, will help us with it. Uh, because that will be uh, something which is global and uh, uh, which will give us a lot of credibility because we have great names in there. Um, so that's the plan for the coming years, starting doing projects all around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, now, this question, I'm not sure what it is. Can you hypothesize us? Hypothesize. No. <laughs> I mean, he meant to hypnotize. <laughs> Is that you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, to kill me. No, no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, so that's from Slido, so we can take some questions from audience. So guys, hit me. Just, I mean, if you want to find out more about what it actually is, behavioral economics, what it can achieve, just uh, go ahead. Come so here. are there behavioral patterns of people that are that can be applied in ninety eight percent of of cases like laziness or this reciprocity. <laughs> <laughs> right. 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 Is there something? Um, uh, I would say yes. I would say yes because um, uh, what behavioral scientists are studying are systematic uh, patterns in uh, in people's uh, thinking and decision making and. Um, you probably have uh, you know the same shortcuts that you're using as as you have, but it doesn't mean that you know they're as strong. That reciprocity will be uh, as strong for you as it will be for you. So uh, uh, yes, but uh, since we're all very different, uh, the same principle can have uh, uh, more impact on on one person and, and less impact on the other person, and that's why uh, it's super important to test. Because what we're not doing is that we're not coming up with strategies based on a psychological profile of an individual. Like you might have heard of uh, Cambridge Analytica. Uh, we're not doing that. I mean, we're working with groups. So not individuals, but groups. And um, depending on the setup, depending on the culture, depending on, um, it can be a team from team. You know, uh, some di a different solution can be the most effective. So uh, that's one of the main pillars of what we do. We design solutions and then we test them because only, you know, I'm still a mathematician. Only hard data can uh, uh, show you which uh, which ones really work and uh, what is the best solution. Okay. <laughs> you said you worked with uh, companies on kind of changing behavior. I Sorry, once again? You said you worked with companies to kind of help change behavior as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think in, in huge corporations like IBM, uh, the aspect of maybe personal accountability is something that they really try to put as, as maybe a key behavior that they would want. Is there any advice that you might give to a large company like this as one practice or a couple practices that they might try to start doing for change? Well, I think. Uh, the first and the most important thing is that you have to uh, change the way how you look at people because um, and it again doesn't matter if uh, you you're doing marketing sales or uh, you're head of HR and you want to change people within an organization um, you know the, the usual way how we uh, perceive people is that the more I give you the more incentives I give you uh, the more inclined to change your behavior you will be. And that's wrong. That's completely wrong. Because uh, I can give you more money and you can be less motivated. It can backfire. So uh, it's a paradigm shift. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a huge shift in, in thinking. Just you know, admitting that it's maybe not about money. It might be uh, about uh, the... Uh, Say social pressure or social norms that we have within a team, which shape my behavior much more 
than the money you're getting giving me. And uh, you know we've uh, worked with the company, and uh, they want to change behavior within the company. And uh, the task was, uh, you know, our people are cheating. They're taking sick leaves when they're not sick. How should we approach this? And uh, you now we, uh, uh, the solution that we designed, uh, didn't, you know, tap into uh, uh, punishments and, uh, and and rewards. It worked with all kind of different aspects, like social norms, like uh, you know. Very often, if you just make uh, an undesired behavior a little bit more complicated, people will stop doing it. If you make uh, uh, desired behavior just a little bit easier, people will start doing it. Um, these tools are not tools which will change 100% or which will you know, completely reverse the behavior. No. But uh, neither will financial incentives, for instance. So um, I would say, and to answer your question, not to be a chef, uh, <laughs> You, uh, there is not the one advice that I would give. Uh, the one advice would be to take that book, predictably rational, and read it. Because uh, on those 200 pages, uh, it will show you how people are different from uh, what you think uh, influences their behaviors. And uh, if you uh, kind of live through uh, this, uh, this uh, shift in, in perception, then you can then you'll start to be open to other ways how to influence the viewers. Um, would you recommend the book you mentioned as a great starting point for people yes. to get inside of behavioral? Yeah. I think I think uh, everybody who asks me about uh, what to start with, I, I recommend uh, predictably rational. Because um, it's an easy read. It's a fun read. Um, Actually, Ariely has a has a new book now. It's called um, in Slovak. It's uh, Psychologia Peniazy. It's not Psychology of Money in English. It's something else. Dollars and blah blah something. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this might be even easier to read because uh, uh, he wrote it together with a comedian. Mm -hmm. uh, so the the content is uh, mm -hmm. I think pretty much the same because they're all recycling their ideas. But um, uh, it should be quite easy to read, so that's a good start. And um, if you want a second book, uh, Influence the Psychology of Persuasion, that's uh, just insane. He, um, Robert Cialdini talks about uh, six universe, universal principles of persuasion. And it's all rooted deeply in science. If you still want to go further, um, Go for thinking fast and slow. By you know what? Uh, but that's not an easy read. I know a lot of people who started but never finished it. <laughs> um, that's by Daniel Kahneman, who got no Nobel Prize for uh, behavioral economics in 2002. And um, uh, well, there's many more. So uh, once you're done with those, just uh, drop me an email and I'll send you a list <laughs> of uh, 55 more. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, what you talked about is behavioral economics is from client perspective or from a company perspective. As a consumer, how can we apply uh, this, for example, to grab an interview or to grab an opportunity like that? Well, um, you can you can apply it in, in many different ways. For example, you can understand uh, why you're buying what you're buying. Um, it helps you understand why you should never go shopping hungry, for instance. Uh, um, so, m my mom was uh, was funny because she was uh, buying a, a coffee machine for for home, and uh, first she uh, she went to um, I think here at night, and uh, she walked through the machines. There was a guy who uh, um, just stopped by. It was another customer, and he just told her, "Look for." What's this? Uh, what's this brand of, of coffee machines? I think it's a Swiss brand, quite a good brand. Espresso? No, 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 no. Yura. Yura. Yeah. It's like look for Yura. And she came home. She um, YouTube some videos, and she was like, 
gosh, it's doing all these beautiful, I don't know, lattes and flat whites and whatever. <laughs> and she called me. Now, I'm, right now I'm living through endowment effects. And the endowment effect, what it is, is that if we imagine that we own something, we value it more. And uh, we uh, don't want to give it up. And that's the reason why when you uh, are buying a new TV, the salesperson shouldn't approach you with the, the usual question, how can I help, help you? Because the usual answer is what? Well, I'm just looking. Uh, but the salesperson should come and uh, should ask you, for instance, so what, what will you be watching most often on TV? <laughs> and as you start you know, telling the story of uh, how you're going to watch your favorite Netflix TV series or how you're going to watch uh, Champions League with your friends and, um, and uh, having a beer, you know, you start internalizing the, the idea and you don't, just don't want to give it up. So he increases his chances, but to we'll get back to you. So, <laughs> um, so you, can, you can understand your, your own behavior. Uh, it can help you change your own behavior. Um, but also, you know, um, it has a huge impact into um, persuasion and influence. And basically, every single communication is about persuasion. And it doesn't matter whether you uh, speak to your boyfriend or you speak to your colleagues or you speak to, uh, um, I don't know, um, someone trying to sell you this TV and you want a discount. It's all about persuasion. Or you, you want to get a new job. How to sell yourself. So uh, it gives you the tools to understand what's going on in the head of the other person so you can shape the message in a way that it works better. So uh, uh, even if you're not working in uh, marketing, sales, uh, you know, um, the, the, the front-facing uh, or the first-line uh, jobs, it doesn't matter. I mean, you can hugely benefit from all this. So definitely go for it. And may I ask you? Sure. What if, you def if you define yourself as a um, struggling customer, who is, as um, an example, buying the coffee machine, is doing the full research of the market, is comparing all the business, all the functions, all the businesses, all, all the um, reviews, everything. Mm -hmm. You are doing deep research for, let's say, 200 uh, costs, and in the end, you end up. With, oh my gosh, I don't know. I don't go, I don't go into anything. So can you work on yourself if you are the, unable to, to decide, yeah. to, to do the final step? Well, this is exactly called choice overload and action paralysis. If you have too many choices, yeah. you suddenly cannot decide. And that's why, for example, I don't look for all the possible choices because uh, I know that um, no, you might maybe end up with a slightly better outcome, you know, if you spend hours researching it, but you won't be happier <laughs> because you, you'll have all the other information. You'll be like, what if I just bought a machine which costs 100 euros less? Wouldn't it be as good as this mm -hmm. one? And uh, no, and there's this trade off between, uh, you know, uh, getting something objectively good or better and being happier with it and uh, at the end of the day you want to be happier and it also depends on whether you're it's called satisfizer or maximizer because maximizers and I'm a maximizer and uh, that's not good you're you know, trying to make the best possible decision if you're a satisfizer it's so much easier to uh, uh, just let go and say well this is good enough and um, well, research again shows that satisfiers are happier people than maximizers. So, um, but again, I mean, it can help you, um, you know, explain what's going on in your head. You'll, you'll, you'll be able to understand what's going on now. Why am I looking for all this uh, information? And uh, uh, why am I not able to decide? And uh, I think understanding is the first uh, good step to uh, changing something. And this helps you understand. And then it gives you also the tools to uh, to change what, what what you're doing or your usual approach. Thank you. I have a question. What was the funniest uh, 
the outcome or findings of your researches mm -hmm. uh, you consider as like this is <laughs> this is insane mind blowing like <laughs> well <laughs> I have I have one in mind right now. It's actually a, a very recent one. We're doing a, a project for for one client. It's a it's a website which uh, compares. I don't want, I I shouldn't go into details, but it compares um, different services. You know, I mean the same service by different providers, and so they have this comparison website, and uh, uh, there are more of these this kind of comparison websites and. Uh, so um, we did consumer research, and you know we observed customers as they browse through the website, through the different websites, and uh, went to find out what makes uh, a website more trustworthy or less trustworthy. And uh, one of the websites had uh, the um, oh, what is it called uh, the, um, the the sign that we have on the flag, you know, the, the national sign, mm -hmm. um, on the website in the logo. And everybody was like, oh, this is super trustworthy. And it had nothing to do with any official organization, nothing at all. But just the shortcut that you see something familiar was like, yeah, I'm going to trust this one. I'd rather use this website than the other five because there's the sign on the website, which makes absolutely no sense. It makes absolutely no, no rational sense. <laughs> and another funny thing, uh, you know, we um, we are based in a co-working um, in Blinska uh, Nivi, Binari, and uh, um, you now all these co-workings, it's it's all super cool, and uh, you have a bar, and you can get all kind of stuff, and uh, we had uh, of course Coke, Sprite, Fanta, and, and this, and it used to be in cans, and. Uh, no one was really buying the cans. And then one day, by mistake, they didn't order cans, but they ordered bottles, the, the glass bottles. And suddenly, everybody started drinking it. <laughs> and they couldn't understand, why, why the hell, what happened? And uh, we were all like, yeah, I, somehow I, I enjoy it more when it's in a, in a glass bottle than the can. <laughs> and uh, this is again a beautiful example of how just changing the context a little bit can hugely influence you. The context is, um, as um, one of the speakers in our course says, context is a marketer's super weapon. Because changing the context doesn't cost you anything. But you can achieve so much bigger results by changing the context, then you would achieve by changing a product, which would cost, which might cost you millions. So context. <coughs> Thank you. Well, very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, any more questions? No. Okay. Well, if you're afraid to ask, just drop me an email. I'll be happy to. Uh, <laughs> Awesome. Thank you very much.